So thank you, Mike. I will um, I will lead us off here. Let me pull up the presentation, and uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And it's a it's a very timely topic. Uh, so we've been trying to provide some clarity and insight uh, into this subject. Screen mode, so because we really see here that um, you know we're at a transition point. You know, you people used to talk about methane as the bridge to the future. Well. It's time to get the off ramps and get off of that bridge because uh, we've gone past the point where it really is is helpful. So it's it's both a huge global problem, but also a huge opportunity. Uh, and one of the things I want to stress here is that um, we're going to try to consistently, and we think everyone should consistently use the term methane when referring to natural gas. Uh, is it it really needs to be called out for what it is. So uh, we're going to go through this because we're engineers as well, or at least at least I am, uh, in a kind of logical way to talk about you know why eliminating methane leaks is is important in terms of reducing the rate of global warming. Um, you know what are the you know all of the the new data that's coming out on the health impacts of indoor gas are significant and have been largely ignored till now. And now we're going to go over the greenwashing that the industry. Uh, and the false solution campaign that they are promoting, uh, which is really designed to up, up, you know, up, support up or prop up their outdated business model. And the fact that we need a strategy to transition away, because if we don't do it in a fair and equitable manner, we're going to, lot of have pe we're going to end up with a lot of people holding the bag for a, uh, a system of infrastructure that is, is not highly utilized. So, you know, but when we step back and think about what the key messages are that you know we think people should general people should understand is that you know heat waves i mean warming and climate change are happening the heat waves are increasingly deadly uh if we continue to rely on methane gas to heat our buildings it's it's not only risky but it's also expensive buildings can we know now can be heated and cooled much more affordably with, with heat pumps, with energy sources that don't heat the planet, um, especially if the electricity is, is, is clean and we're heading in that direction already. You know, as our homes need to be clean and safe and burning and breathing the, the byproducts from burning methane is not safe or healthy. And that, you know, we can reduce the costs and protect the planet by phasing out methane and, and using 100% electricity for heating and cooling buildings. And I want to stress that it really, the focus is on the building sector. Um, so to start off this part one, and, and we're going to alternate, I'm going to you know, switch off with Dan and Michael for other sections of this, but uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about where methane is used, you know, what its impact is on global warming, you know, what's, is there a role for it in a decarbonized role? You know, what can be done to reduce leaks and what's happening in the near term? You know, so, you know, methane is used, you know, if you look at the U.S., it's its you know, largest use is electricity generation still, um, even though, you know, Oregon, of course, has moved and a few other states moved to, to clean energy goals. But, you know, about a third of it is industry and about 26 percent total is in our building sector for residential and commercial uses. And if you look at the biggest uses in our building, which is space heating and water heating, right now gas is a, a little over half of that, with you know other fuels being used uh, uh, to to smaller degrees. And um, okay, and and this is actually direct fuel use. This doesn't include the electricity, which which is used in our building sector. Now. Switching over to you know methane and its impact on global warming, um, I think I think everybody here probably knows you know when you burn methane you get CO two which is greenhouse gas but if methane leaks, whether it's at the production wells and the transmission pipelines and the storage tanks and the compressor stations, uh, it your at your home furnace or stove every time you turn on your gas stove. A little bit of methane leaks out. Um, that that methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas, as as we all 
I think most of us here already know. CO2 has a constant effect over the centuries, but methane has a very big impact early on. It's, it's got a lifetime in the atmosphere of about 12 years, and it decays slowly over time, kind of somewhat like a half-life. And you know what, what the IPCC has been done from doing for many years, because they take these long-term looks, has been using the, the 100 year averaged impact of that methane, which you can see in the little chart on the right. Now, if you look at that impact on a, on a, a five-year periodic basis, you can see that the first 15, 20 years, it's much greater impact than, than what's, what the 100-year average is. And this is what we're focusing on in terms of why reducing near-term methane leaks is, uh, is going to reduce in the near term the rate of warming because that methane is 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 a near term accelerant to our global warming problems so you know where does so where does these methane leaks come from you know most of it's from the oil and gas sector um over 30 percent of it um and you know that is based upon some pretty optimistic uh leak rates uh, and much more recent data from satellites and from other uh, you know, new monitoring types of technologies is it, it's looking in some cases much higher than that. Um, and that makes a big difference. Um, you know, at I think at about a three and a half percent leak rate, um, the global warming impact of, of burning natural gas for electricity generation is the same as from coal. Um, and so that, that leak rate has a big impact on the overall life cycle emissions from, from, from methane gas facilities. You know, there are other, other sources, of course, you know, the enteric fermentation that happens in ruminant animals, cows and horses and things like that, um, when they chew their cud, uh, liberates methane, but there we're coming up with solutions like seaweed and stuff to, to handle that. Um, landfills is another big source, and then dairy farms and combined animal feedlot type operations, as well as things like coal mining. Um, but in Oregon here, that's not a particular issue for us. Um, and then methane emissions are continuing to go up dramatically, and something that a lot of us worry about are various tipping points that, in fact, could be influenced by the near-term uh, impact of these methane releases. Um, the real hope is that the you know, upcoming satellite measurements uh, are gonna provide us with a lot better data and a lot more ability to go focus in on particular facilities and activities that are resulting in these, in these leaks. Um, and you know, finally here, you know, there are things that are happening. I mean, the Biden's executive order on methane emissions, um, that's an important step. Um, here in Oregon, the Climate Protection Plan is putting pressure on the natural gas utilities to reduce their supply of fossil gas. Um, we're looking much more closely at and challenging the, the picture that the natural gas industry or the methane gas industry is painting with regards to how they can meet those requirements. And um, in the executive order as well, um, the, our Department of Energy now, or the Department of Environmental Quality, is now monitoring and has rules in place for landfills that fall below the EPA limit that regulates them at the federal level. So we're filling that, that gap as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan now to talk about the health impacts of indoor, air, indoor gas use. Okay, next chart, please. Sorry. So, um, health impacts from methane is one of the is is one of the big levers we have to convince uh, legislators uh, and regulators to uh, take a harder harder line. Uh, methane methane is a bad thing to have in your house, and 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 uh, it hasn't really been talked about. Um, <clears throat> you can in the time you cook an egg on a on a methane stove. Uh, the, the air quality in your kitchen can uh, exceed the outdoor pollution standards. 
you'll note, uh, 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 and uh, cooking with methane gas produces nitrous uh, oxide, nitrous dioxide, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, particulate matter, um, and, and things like particulate matter that are also uh, generated by electric cooktops, uh, the particulate matter uh, generated by a methane cooktop is, is more than twice as large. So the fossil fuel industry knows this and has lobbied uh, Congress uh, at both uh, at the federal level to not pass indoor pollution standards <clears throat> and at the state level from requiring gas stoves to be vented outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last point I will make, and I'll come to this to the end of the session, is that the indoor pollution uh, overwhelmingly affects vulnerable uh, uh, populations, children, lower income households, BIPOC, BIPOC communities, uh, 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 overweight uh, people of all ages. Next chart. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, where does this come from? Carbon monoxide uh, uh, and formaldehyde uh, uh, come from incomplete uh, combustion. Uh, nitrous oxides like uh, come from the oxidation of nitrogen during combustion. Volatile combat, compounds, sulfur dioxide, these are side products of combustion. And it should, and it should, and one must remember that all stoves and cooktops leak, even when they're not turned on so that there is a constant flow of, of uh, small amounts of methane, even when you're not using the stove. Uh, and this has been, this is proved recently by measuring the ambient uh, methane in uh, 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 apartments and homes without gas stoves and apartments and homes with gas stoves where the gas stoves have, are off and you get about twice as much methane floating around just from the, uh, the leaks. Um, there are some places, the World Health Organization, and, and for example, Canada have standards for indoor air quality. Uh, the United States does not, and the, and the fossil fuel industry uh, is uh, uh, spending money lobbying to keep it that way. Next chart. Okay, so, so uh, what do these things do? The nitrous oxide cause a, a, a bunch of largely respiratory problems. Uh, there were data came out in uh, uh, a medical journal uh, the last couple of years that children in homes with gas stoves have a 42% increased risk of asthma symptoms. 42%, that's a, that's a, that's a high num number. Carbon monoxide, well, it can, it can kill people, so that's a bad thing. <laughs> um, you, you can read for yourself the other, the other impacts here. Particulate matter also um, largely uh, respiratory uh, uh, problems, uh, low birth weight, just like uh, carbon monoxide for, for babies and formaldehyde, uh, you know, another known carcin carcinogen that simply no longer belongs in our homes. Next chart. All right, and who does this, who does this impact? Um, so uh, renters, renters have less control over uh, application installation and maintenance. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, they're affected uh, more than say uh, middle-class homeowners. Renters and owners with older residences, less efficient appliances without the money to upgrade. Uh, uh, smaller residences leading to higher pollution concentrations. Um, and, and uh, so, you know, people are, people spend more time close to the, close to the kitchen. Uh, uh, what a really bad thing to do for health in the home is to use gas stoves for incremental heating that occurs largely in um, uh, low income households, as does more people per residence, uh, resulting in more cooking and being closer to the scene of cooking. Uh, children are, are disproportionately affected because they have higher physical rates, uh, uh, activity rates, which lead to much greater inhalation rates, and they spend more time at home than adults. And overweight individuals are, are uh, uh, disproportionately affected for the, for the same reason. Inhalation rate uh, scale with body size, they, they inhale more, uh, and they, they, the health impacts are, are, are greater. So what can we do about this? Um, the number one thing we can do uh, is, is talk to any, every, every time, we started this last year, every time we talk to our legislators, 
uh, which we try to do in an organized fashion in MCAT three times a year. Uh, we, we, we give them a new set of messages on, um, on, <clears throat> um, um, uh, on methane. This last spring, we gave them a one pager on the health impacts. Uh, uh, this fall, we're, we plan to give them a, 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 another document on, on, on greenwash. So that's the, that's the, the most important thing to do. Uh, but there's also things you can do and people should know about. Uh, I did not know this until last year, but um, uh, uh, use of ventilation, range hoods vented to the outside can significantly decrease uh, pollutant concentrations. If you have a gas range, you should use the hoe and it's and it's uh, vented to the outside. With uh, uh, you should use hood fans 100% of the time. We did not do this. Uh, my son uh, 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 was not happy when he when he when he read this and, and said, you know, we we could have been better parents, right? Uh, uh, so, but this is the number one thing you should do. You know, starting today, if you have a gas stove. If you have the opportunity, replace your gas stoves or electric cooktops at ranges at the end of the life or sooner if possible. It's 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 cleaner air, it's safer, no flame. Uh, the cooktop don't heat up directly. I find it. Uh, we we installed a, a electric induction cooktop in our place uh, last year. I I find it a, a lifestyle upgrade. It's better for cooking. Uh, it's easier to clean. And we just learned, all of us on our team just learned a couple of weeks ago, we saw a, uh, there's a YouTube video uh, floating around that uh, you can buy an electric induction hot pad for 50, 60 bucks, plug it into the 110, and they showed an experiment. Uh, you can heat, you can uh, boil water faster. Uh, it is, it is, uh, uh, these uh, you Google them; they're available on Amazon. And so, even uh, even if you uh, can't, aren't ready, you can't afford or, or or can't get 240 power to uh, an island, um, you can cut down your gas use by you know buying a fifty dollar electric uh, induction hot pad and and use it or buy two. So uh, that's it, uh, Michael. Okay, next slide, please, Pat. Up there, the next yeah. one. Here we go. After decades of misleading the public that fossil gas is not much of a problem, uh, the industry is uh, seeing the realities of the climate crisis closing in on their market share. So they've responded with a blitz of greenwashing campaigns and assertions that they will offer cleaner, greener fuels. Uh, that will meet our climate goals. However, in reality, these, as we've said, are merely efforts to continue an outdated business model that, uh, that will limit our ability to address the climate crisis. Uh, the biggest use of, no, I think we're still on the first slide, uh, yeah. The biggest use of methane in Oregon are the plants that burn it to generate much of our electric power. These will be completely phased out by 2040 in compliance with HB 2021. Most of the remaining market share is for heating buildings, hot water, and cooking. All of these can be done more efficiently with electric power and doing so obviously significantly reduces the emissions. This is obviously an existential threat to an industry that only has one product, methane. It would be naive to assume that the, that the industry won't push back as hard as they can. Advocates for climate action need to be prepared. And so these are the five elements uh, of the industry's various efforts to try and prop up their business model that we're gonna cover. So next slide, please, Pat. Deceptive advertising practices commonly called greenwashing are used to make companies seem like their products are more climate friendly than they actually are. A new study of thousands of communications materials by the five largest oil and gas companies found green claims in most of their messaging. It also found that these companies are engaging with policymakers to uh, directly to advocate for development of new oil and gas. Accordingly, according to a U uh, to the UN. Uh, World governments plan to produce more than twice the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with limiting warming to 
degrees Celsius, which of course is our goal, our ultimate goal. They also report that the industry is planning on increasing production beyond 2030. The UN noted a real push, particularly in the United States for fossil gas, AKA methane to be included and to be considered as green or a low carbon solution. Research indicates that the American public has a very different feeling about natural gas than they do about methane, even though they're the same thing. A recent poll found that 77% had a favorable view of natural gas, far higher than when they were asked about their views on methane. Less than a third knew natural gas is actually methane. In the same poll, a majority incorrectly answered that they think methane pollution is declining or staying the same. Other surveys show similar results. The reason for this disconnect is embedded in the very name natural gas. The word natural tends to bias Americans to view whatever it is affixed to us, healthy, clean, and environmentally friendly. Northwest Natural's Less We Can campaign is a play on the popular Obama slogan, but in reality is a greenwashing campaign bordering on deception. It claims to be saving carbon emissions and minimizing harmful effects of its product. At the same time, Northwest Natural is actually increasing its annual carbon emissions. And it's add, as it adds more customers, in, incentivizes home builders to install gas appliances and lobbies elected officials at the state, local, and federal level to prevent uh, laws and efficiency standards that would reduce emissions. It's clear that Northwest Natural and the wider gas industry are making highly misleading statements that appear to that they have, uh, and I'll quote, an important role to play in helping our region move toward a low carbon renewable energy future. Not only are they failing to do that, uh, to achieve that future, they are actively and systematically fighting government efforts to reduce carbon emissions. So next slide, please. Renewable natural gas may sound green, but it isn't. It's methane, chemically identical to fossil fuels. It's generated at widely scattered sites throughout Oregon, such as sewage plants, landfills, and dairy farms, as, um, as bacteria decompose the waste. This biomethane should be captured and used as a fuel at the site where it's generated if that's feasible. Otherwise, it should be flared to avoid release to the, at the release of the methane to the atmosphere, where, where as you know, it's 84 times more potent than CO2. As an alternative to fossil gas, RNG can potentially only supply very limited amounts from these dairy farms, uh, CFOs, and landfills. It would also require substantial additional investments to collect, process, and distribute that biomethane. And these added costs would be borne, would have to be borne by a shrinking base of ratepayers who increasingly will consist of lower income renters. Research estimates that uh, Methane leaks from these biogas type facilities are in the 4% 4, 4 range up to as much as 15% in some cases. Additional methane leakage will have substantial climate impacts over the methane that's already leaked. Since these landfills and other waste streams are only capable of producing limited amounts of methane compared to their fossil gas resources, the industry may try and supplement supply with energy crops. Uh, the perverse land use effects of energy crop expansion for intentional methane production may render um, renewable natural gas even more carbon intensive than fossil gas. It also could affect food supply in other sectors. Uh, next slide, please, Pat. Green hydrogen will play a crucial role in our energy future, but it is not the role envisioned by the gas industry. First, a few basics. There are, there's more hydrogen in the universe than any other element. It's been estimated 90% of all atoms are hydrogen. 
Unlike methane, when hydrogen gas is burned, its emissions are only water and heat. Hydrogen can be used in a fuel cell also to generate electricity, and doing so, again, only emits water and some heat. So why isn't hydrogen a good replacement for methane as the gas industry claims? The reason is, is that their customers mostly use that gas for space heating, as we've discussed, water heating and, and cooking. Uh, a better solution for each of these is direct electrification. Uh, obviously, using electricity for these applications would cut out the gas utility. So they're trying to hang on to these remaining market segments with hydrogen. Although direct electrification is the best replacement for fossil fuels as we transition our economies to a low carbon future, there will be uh, in the greater uh, economy, some applications that are difficult to electrify. Those applications include long distance aviation, marine shipping, some, some industrial manufacturers such as steel and cement. The best choice for these will likely be hydrogen. Um, yeah, I think we can, we don't need to go through that. Uh, so this, uh, well, this slide just brings up some more uh, points, uh, some of which we cover. The last one I'll, I'll mention is uh, embrittlement in steel pipes. Uh, that's why it would require the complete gas grid to be upgraded uh, if they're going to try and start putting hydrogen uh, mixed in with the gas or even pure hydrogen. Next slide, please, Pat. These two flowcharts summarize the basic fallacy behind the fossil gas industry solutions to decarbonize their product with biogas and hydrogen. The simple flowchart on the top illustrates what many studies confirm that rapid electrification of space and water heating of buildings is proven, cost-effective, highly efficient, and is a reliable, uh, there are reliable technologies to do it. However, this pathway, as we've said, doesn't offer much opportunity for the methane gas industry. So instead, they want to try and convince the public that the scheme depicted on the bottom flow chart is a viable alternative. Instead of heating buildings directly, they suggest risky alternative fuels and technologies such as renewable natural gas, hydrogen, um, and uh, gas heat pumps, the, these path, this, low, this pathway depicted in the, lower, <clears throat> in the lower slide has many additional problems such as uh, limited uh, supply limits that we've talked about, extensive costs relating to uh, exp expensive costs related to additional infrastructure investments and a lot more energy inputs. Next slide, please, Pat. Uh, uh, Michael, can I inject I, a point here? Because sure. uh, this is something that came up recently and that is the claim that this is actually CO2 neutral is, is actually false because this captured CO2 came from some fossil resources, most likely. And so this is like a catch and release scheme where they're actually claiming that, the, you know, that this synthetic methane is actually a clean fuel when in fact it's, it's actually emitting CO2 that has been was captured previously, so it's it's uh, it, it, it's even more insidious than we thought. Good. Okay. Next slide, please, Pat. <clears throat> As the uh, reality of the existential crisis for methane gas becomes more apparent, Northwest Natural, Avista, and Cascade Natural Gas sued the state, our state on March 18th saying that the Department of Environmental Quality had no authority to regulate greenhouse gases under the Climate Protection Program put in place by uh, Governor Brown in 2020. Brown used her executive authority to create the rules after the Repu to create the rules after the Republicans walked out of the Capitol to block climate legislation. The EEO uh, executive order seeks to reduce um, emissions by 45% by 1990 and, and levels uh, from 1990 levels by 2035 and 80% by 2050, 
by capping emissions from providers like Northwest Natural. Next slide, please. Finally, it's worth noting that 21 states have already passed um, preemption laws and four more are now considering them. These ban on bans strip local communities of decision-making authority over climate and health impacts and the cost uh, of their future homes and buildings. Uh, this worrisome trend is another example of the industry's pushback and hamstrings local government's ability to lead the fight against local air pollution and climate change. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, moving on to strategy. Um, it, it, to summarize here, you know, we really need a transition away from that methane gas. We need to, first thing is to stop investing in new gas infrastructure for residential and commercial buildings, starting as soon as possible. Um, you know, then we need a transition plan for electrification of our existing buildings, I would say preferably by 2045, with, with targeted incentives that help us drive phased and equitable electrification and then phased decommissioning of those portions of the gas grid that are no longer needed. Um, you know, we need to support research and development and demonstration of technologies to continue to support our grid reliability. Um, but one of the things that, that we need to keep in mind here is that in Oregon, while a little over half of our buildings are, or 60% of our buildings are heated by natural gas, the, uh, there's another 35 or so percent that are using electric resistance heating. And if we switch out those electric resistance heating units at the same, with heat pumps at the same time that we replace our, uh, our gas systems and the increase in the peak winter demand on our electric system becomes much, much more manageable, much, much more manageable. Um, and I think the, the final thing here is we really need to stress the benefits of lower consumer costs and greater health and comfort benefits that come with cleaner uh, electric uh, heat pumping technology for heating and for cooling. Um, and this has been said many times, but uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, energy systems modeling. I follow a lot of these reports. Um, we know what the answer is to how to most cost-effectively decarbonize our entire energy system. And that is to make all of our electricity 100% clean, to convert our transportation fleets to electric vehicles, to convert our buildings and industry where possible to electricity, and to have some carbon-free fuels that provide long-term storage, reliability, and used for hard to electrify applications. So those are our, our, the, the core strategies that underpin everything that we do in, in terms of policy here. Um, you know, so the first thing here is, you know, and I've, I've explained some of this, I'm gonna go a little more detail here. Um, you know, we need to start with things like removing the, um, the um, line extension allowance, excuse me, I had a blank there for a minute. The line extension allowance is a subsidy to the gas utilities to expand their customer base. That is currently something that we're pushing very hard against in the, um, in the PUC processes where we can push on that. Um, and, and the other thing we want to do is push the risk on away from utility customers to utility shareholders when it comes to making new investments in any kind of gas infrastructure or gas technology. Um, let's see. Um, you know, uh, the transition plan as um, one of the things that we don't have is a process for looking across the electric and gas energy systems to figure out what is the most cost-effective strategy. There are, you know, the, the, the regulatory processes in our state kind of silo those activities. So, you know, those of us engaged in the Northwest Naturals IRP process are, are continually frustrated because they essentially do a customer load forecast and then they figure out how to optimally supply 
that customer load without looking at the interaction in terms of how that customer load might change over time. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that, that need to be focused on, um, but, um, you know, there are things that are gonna help us, you know, um, ensure our long-term reliability of our electricity system as we transition away from natural gas and things like smarter distribution grids, uh, long-term storage technologies. Um, and um, you know, this, this, this planning process should help us if, if we were to implement a integrated comprehensive planning process, it would help us identify timelines uh, much perhaps better in terms of how quickly or what's the cost benefit trade-off between more quickly electrifying uh, our buildings um, and uh, identifying targeted incentives for, uh, for phased electrification. What are the right incentives and, and how do we most geographically make those both efficient and equitable as we move forward with this transition? Um, and I think we wanna end here most importantly with with actions that individuals can undertake because this actually is an area where individual choice matters. If the first thing is messaging. We need to continually change the terminology and, and name this for what it is, methane gas. Um, continue to stress how important a uh, driver it is to near-term climate change and you know, vote for climate champions because again, the more progressive Democrats we have in our legislature, the better it is for climate legislation. Um, but individually, you know, if everyone replaced their gas furnace and gas water heater when they broke down, because the average life is 20 years, within 20 years, we'd be completely electrified. Now we can certainly accelerate that and we really need to think about how to do that in an equitable fashion. Um, so again, you know, we can ask our municipal and county and state representatives for, for natural, you know, methane gas hookup bans in the name of, of safety and, and health, uh, as well as climate. Um, and I think, you know, we have some people on the call here who are leading the charge in that area um, in terms of our, uh, you know, the city of Eugene here in Oregon, the city of Milwaukee, um, and and others. So, um, and I think one good source of information uh, everyone should be aware of is Electrify Now. Uh, they have an excellent website that covers all of these areas um, and with with videos and and other useful information. Um, you know, other things that that people can do depending upon your level of of activism. Um, you know, write to your legislators. Make sure that they're aware of of these issues and your concern about them. Um, you know, continue to get, you know, get active with the Energy Trust of Oregon or with the Public Utility Commission to continue to put pressure on them to, to move in the direction of transitioning us away from, from methane gas. Um, and, and take your individual action and, you know, to the best of your ability whenever you have the chance to make a choice between electricity and, and gas, make that choice. And then finally, if you're interested in, in more information about uh, the Metro Climate Action Team and uh, you know, what we do, um, and we try to send out you know, various, um, not too many emails, but enough important emails in terms of action alerts and upcoming events, uh, things like that, that uh, people find useful. So please go to our, uh, send us an email and with we'll subscribe in the subject line and we will add you to our mailing list. So I think we're ready to take questions now. I don't know if, if Dan or Michael, you guys have been able to monitor chat, but I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can take questions. Ah. Conrad, firsthand, let's see. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. So 
on the um, strategy, which I absolutely agree with, which is, you know, electrify space and water heating as fast as possible. Um, when you do the math on sort of existing uh, residential electric heat, the resistance is mostly in multifamily, which is a very low demand. It's uh, so converting that to heat pumps is not going to give you much gain on reduction of demand. So you're going to have actually, if you do in, in single family major conversions, you're going to have a substantial increase in demand. But you can and it must, as part of the incentive process, include a requirement for uh, some form of remote control on the heat pump. And with water heaters, there's already an easy way to do that with a socket that's required on that. You just plug in a communication device. Actually, the heat pumps can be, you know, that we can make heat pumps have the same requirement. It's not in law like the water heaters, but you need to have a form of control so that uh, dynamic times of like with wind production, you don't really know when that's going to be. So you wouldn't need to, you know, preheat the home, even if it's a degree or two, so that when the wind goes away, you have a little bit of shifting from the time of renewable to non-renewable. So it's very important. And then when at peak times, you can, you know, cut back the temperatures a little bit using thermal mass in the house. So it's very important to include, as part of the incentive process, controls for the peak load. Sure. No, no, I think you make a good point, although on the on the the, the uh, especially kind of the yeah the the electric resistance heating that's kind of um, used only periodically. You're right. We there wouldn't be much reduction in total energy demand or annual energy demand. But uh, if you're looking at the peak period, then you then you really need to figure. You know, you need to count on that. Um, that that's probably going to be wanting to be operated at that time. Uh, when you're having one of your coldest days in the winter. Um, but I think your, your point about, you know, having smarter grids, having smarter appliances, having them better integrated so that you take advantage of your weather and predict when you're going to have peak wind times, when you're going to have low wind times, what's happening with your solar resource, um, how does it all fit together, what storage do you have, and things like distributed generation and distributed storage are also going to play large roles, I believe, in, in both resilience as well as uh, peak load management uh, as we move into the future. Yeah, and I would add to that, I absolutely agree on the batteries. Shifting, when you think about cloudy days in winter, any solar that exists is going to be almost totally non-functional in terms of energy production for uh, anywhere uh, west of the Cascades. And so all, you know, the, there is gonna have to be a backup supply if the wind isn't blowing for that. And hopefully it's renewable. They haven't got a solution for that, but it's gonna come. Um, but the point you know, is it, solar sure. subsidies are really a huge waste of money right now. And all of that money ought to be used towards battery incentives. Besides, people are putting solar in without batteries, and that should just be plain outlawed. But really, the money for subsidies for solar should go 100% to batteries, not to solar panels. Besides, right. rooftop solar is three times more expensive than utility scale solar, and it's not providing any contribution when you need it most in the winter. So, you know. We need to stop subsidizing solar. Great, thanks, Conrad. Uh, we have a phone number. I think it's maybe Stuart, if I recognize the last four digits. Yeah, uh, this is Stuart Leibowitz. I'm with the Douglas County Global Warming Coalition out of Roseburg, and I, I'd like to direct this towards Michael. I've got uh, three comments, and if you'd like to comment on my comments, I'm fine. Uh, it all has to do with RNG. The first part is that the fact they call it renewable is part of the deceptive advertising because people think if something is renewable, then it must be clean. Um, 
The second uh, point I'd like to make is that uh, RNG gives a perverse incentive to increase our landfills, increase our dairy farms, because that is where the source of their RNG will be primarily uh, uh, occurring. And if you could also comment on the fact that even though our climate protection plan uh, is uh, designed to reduce emissions 80% by 2050, uh, the reality is uh, DEQ has embraced RNG as one of the uh, one of the ways uh, to measure uh, carbon reduction. So, if you would like to comment on any of those comments, uh... yeah, I had difficulty hearing those. I, I think the first one was on supply. Is that correct? No. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, let me repeat them real quick. Uh, my, my three points were as follows that uh, uh, RNG, using the term renewable, uh, gives a false impression that it's clean. That's part of the uh, deception. The second part is that it gives a perverse incentive for landfills and, and dairy farms to increase because that's their source. And the third point I made was that when you pointed out that, uh, that we have the Climate Protection Plan reducing emissions 80% by 2050, unfortunately, Oregon DEQ has embraced uh, RNG as one of the measurements for uh, carbon reduction. So if you want to comment on any of that, uh, I would welcome that. Well, I would start by saying, uh, you know, just sticking to what I said in, in the presentation, I really don't think uh, renewable natural gas uh, can uh, you know, I, I'm not really, I'm not familiar with the DEQ. You said the DEQ is uh, uh, promoting RNG? Yes, uh, DEQ has embraced uh, RNG as one of the mechanisms that uh, they will uh, use to uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions under the Climate Protection Program. Well, I mean, it certainly makes sense at, at uh, for for large municipalities to uh, harness renewable natural gas. They're doing it here in Portland, up on uh, up mm -hmm. up off of uh, I think it's just south of Marine Drive, uh, and they've put that facility in. I think that's a that's a good choice, and they're uh, I believe they're generating electricity with it and putting it right into the grid. So it makes sense there. I think. Uh, what the general point is on renewable natural gas is, is, is building a huge um, gas grid, in, uh, pipeline grid to gather it from all the different sources and, uh, and try and feed that into the grid uh, is just uh, doesn't make financial or climate sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. Stuart, the way I look at um, the, the these inter the, you know we have these existing sources of methane that have resulted from I think you know other choices that have been made with regards to how to do agriculture and how to do animal husbandry et cetera et cetera and yes while we're we have those sources available we should tap them locally but we should not be multiplying or reproducing those sources just to get methane that that's ridiculous we should be actually moving in a better direction with regards to how we do those activities related to agriculture. And does that help? Maybe we lost him. Thank you. Oh, oh, there you are. Great. Okay, Kathy. Okay, a couple other things. Um, I've been following the uh, all of the IRPs and I'm, I think I'm actually a member of MCAT. <laughs> yes. Um, and one thing in their draft IRP, I believe it's the first time I've seen them putting in a significant amount of synthetic methane. Previously, they had planned on just using renewable natural gas and hydrogen. And so I think we need to look at the, uh, you know, I don't consider that to be renewable necessarily. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, uh, you know, I, well, yeah, I think because, we, we, because the carbon dioxide, the, it uses carbon dioxide and they are proposing to get the carbon dioxide from 
like the natural gas power plants. Yeah, or captured so from, some, just, from some it's, fossil it's source. It's just changing yes. the place where they're generating carbon dioxide to let the electricity generators say we're carbon free. And meanwhile, you're still getting the carbon dioxide. Also, yeah. another thing that's come up in our discussions, I assume most of the people are familiar with the renewable energy credits that you can buy from your uh, electricity right. supplier. Well, there's an equivalent for uh, renewable natural gas called uh, renewable thermal credits. And what Oregon, and I'm not sure if it's legislation or agency, has decided is that you can buy what they call the environmental attributes, which means you don't actually buy the gas, you just buy the part that says, this is good. And you can do it for gas, you can buy them for gas that's generated anywhere and use them to cover your fossil natural, natural gas use in Oregon. So these are a couple of the issues that I think MCAT and, and a number of the rest of us are, are working on. Right. Yeah, there, there is some dispute with regards to whether these renewable thermal credits can be used as compliance for um, the clean protection plan, so climate protection plan. Yes. Um, I want to mention that uh, Adam had asked a question about hydrogen concentrations in the chat. I, I did answer that in the chat, but just to say that typically the generally accepted um, limit for how much hydrogen you can put in a pipeline, a, a steel pipeline without causing embrittlement issues is about 20% by volume, which is about 70% by energy content. So. The most they can get is, you know, seven percent of your energy supply um, by mixing it with natural gas. Which, um, and they're actually proposing a pilot project, a, a an R and D project in the city of Eugene that's going to mix in hydrogen to a small section of the gas distribution grid there, which is another thing we're paying attention to. Uh, just a um, note on that: uh, I'm actually please. involved in the design team on that project. Oh, okay. So that's, I have a in, inside view. Um, do you mind sharing it? Well, I mean, there's not really that much to share other than it's just, uh, you know, just taking the electricity from the grid. We don't, we, we haven't been told where the, if they're gonna be using excess electricity to try to like be from, from renewable sources or anything. It's just, right. a, a, just a big electrolyzer that's gonna, you know, Produce hydrogen yeah, my, and then pump it into the, into the pipeline. Right. My understanding, it's a one megawatt electrolyzer, right. and they are going to be trying to buy the cleanest electricity they can on the grid. And I think part of it is to try to figure out whether or not there's going to be this, you know, relatively low cost electricity market from curtailed solar and wind uh, as developing in the near future, but, um, one megawatt you know, our, our problem one, is, is not, is not the, I'm sorry. One megawatt is phase one. There's, they're planning further phases too. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, but again, our problem is the application that, um, hydrogen is going to be an expensive fuel and it really, you know, it makes more sense for it to go to higher value applications than, um, than heating homes. John. You're muted, John, still. No. What's that? As a uh, futurist, I think it would be in mind uh, that the future is electric because the climate, as we yeah, we're having trouble hearing you. Uh, Maybe you turn off your, audio, your video. Toast because it costs more and more to work. John, we, I we have, can. I have a. You're breaking you're up, John. About, John. Great. Try now. Yeah. I, John, we can't hear you. I. I have unstable uh, internet. I will uh, try again later. Okay. All right. Let's move on to, uh, to Lisa. 
Hi, I just wanted to, um, as you pointed out, a good presentation. We've had similar presentations from different presenters um, to the Milwaukee City Council. Um, I just wanted to point out, as you noted, Northwest Natural is digging in hard and um, uh, you know, bringing lawsuits and challenging things uh, that DEQ and P PUC do. Um, and that is, of course, um, the threat that hangs over cities. Um, that uh, whichever the cities that act will be sued by Northwest Natural. So I really do hope that people start focusing at the state level and not necessarily to ask the state to ban new infrastructure. I don't see that passing, um, but, but to pass to enact something that makes clear that cities and localities have this authority. And I think the state could create a safe, some safe haven for the cities that want to act on this. And um, I think it's really important to be pressing since next year is the regular session to be pressing the state on that, on making it, uh, you know, on, on some kind of legislation that provides the flexibility for cities and counties to do this and provides some protection from litigation. So Lisa, two, two things. Um, uh, one, uh, there is pressure from Northwest Natural at the state level as well. And one of the things that we are attempting to do is, is, is better inoculate our legislators against their, their, their campaign. Second, uh, and, and I asked Mark Gamba uh, to comment on your point. I, I, I think I saw a work that said, in fact, cities already have uh, protection from the state for um, uh, 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 for for regulating gas and other things, did I get that right, Mark? Well, there's a, there's a law that um, allows us to allow or not allow anything in our right of way. So, just by virtue of that, we could say we are not allowing any more. Uh, uh, natural gas pipelines into our right of way. What Lisa is getting at, I think, is is still at, is still appropriate or accurate, though that uh, they will find some aspect uh, to come after us about. Um, I think there are also state laws that, and I I'll forget exactly how they're stated, but it's something to do with. Um, making sure that they provide the services that are requested of them. So there's gonna be that dynamic between those two laws. If, if we say you can't put any more pipes in, in, our, in our right of way, but then they're required to provide the service. So th there, there's still gonna be room for trouble. Uh, they'll, they'll, find, they'll find, I mean, they're gonna spend a fortune on lawyers. So, Lisa's is not wrong. And our, our, uh, in a built out city like Milwaukee, if you're a city where you've got an, you know, urban growth banner, you've got a growth potential, that, that uh, ability to control your right of way is more impactful than in a built out city where like Milwaukee, where we're having infill development. So the pipes in the right of way are probably mostly there. It would help us curtail something but it probably would have a lot of impact in a city like milwaukee because the the main the streets probably have the pipes in them already right um so mm -hmm. the i mean it, it it seems to me like these are primarily harassment suits do, do, how much merit do they actually have well whether they have merit or not, if they cost the city millions of dollars to to defend, they've done their yeah. job, right? And that's and then, then you know whichever city goes first becomes the uh, what's the phrase right. the, uh, the, the dire warning to um, to other cities. Yeah, you, you know, and yeah, it's 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 absolutely a thing with, that we're going to have to sort out and and. So if, if you have folks that are thinking about this and are thinking about laws, um, mm -hmm. I'm still struggling with what the law would look like that, that 
yeah. this allows a, a utility from suing a municipality. Well, if you uh, if you come up with we yeah. Uh, I don't think we, we're the right people to, to, to <laughs> develop that either. Uh, but if you come up with such a thing, we'd, we'd be happy to, to jump in and help support it. Yeah. Great. Well, it's uh, one o'clock and uh, I was thinking if anyone has something they really need to say, uh, now's the time. iPad has an on a name, a hand up, but okay. I don't know who that is iPad. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, it's a, you know it's a great idea to not spread out more gas uh, in the world. However, we still have the natural gas being uh, or the the methane being produced in the in the dumps and all these other places. Okay. And so it seems to make sense. Uh, to do something with it, not just for, not, not not just ignore it. And uh, my understanding is, if you burn it, then it's actually going to be CO two, which isn't as bad as the methane. And we have a problem with the Pacific Northwest: is that we have a increased growth of population, and we don't have significant amount of power to to back that up. So we have peak times that. Uh, we have to generate electricity some way, and uh, you know the solar and wind are are not uh, they're not constant, and the battery storage is questionable, and so uh, it seems to me that maybe the the way to do that is to use that methane and store it until you have a, a need for it for peaks and that kind of stuff, and then use it to generate electricity to cover the cover the peaks. Hey, I, so. I think the issue here is. It, it, that all makes sense, but the issue here is we're gonna we need to transition over the next twenty or so years, and we need to do it in a sensible fashion such that we you know we maintain the services of existing customers while we move other customers to electricity, and we we figure out how we're gonna manage um, the various. Uh, um, variability in the, both the supply in terms of solar wind, mix that with our hydro resource. And as we figure out better how to manage our demands and how to bring those things into sync, we have years to develop and to figure out how to do this transition. And I, I think, you know, we should not think about, oh my goodness, we're gonna have to do this overnight because we don't, we, it's a step-by-step -step process. We need to really set a goal, we figure out how to make this transition work again, as I said earlier, in the in the most cost effective and the most equitable way. Right. We can. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. Well, Pat and Michael and Dan, thank you so much for this presentation. I talked a little bit with Michael and he said we could have a copy of the PowerPoint and uh, if you could send that to me and anybody that would like that copy, uh, please send the email to myself here, Mike Unger at Comcast.net. And anyone who wants a pro professional development hour or professional engineering, please also send that to me. And uh, also want to make an announcement that next month, we're going to have a presentation from DPA on their transmission grid. So we're looking forward to that. Before we wrap it up, any final comments that need to be made? Thank you all for joining us. A great presentation, fellas. Great. Thank you for organizing this, Mike. You bet. Thanks, Mike. You bet.